Okay, so here's a, the upcoming. Um, next time we're going to talk about eternity. We're going to spend one session on eternity, if that's possible. Uh, we'll, we'll look at chapters 20 through 22. So here's the remaining schedule for our last three classes. We have Easter on the 28th. Uh, so next week is eternity. We're going to look at the, the great white throne judgments. What happens after the millennial, uh, the millennial kingdom and afterwards? Now, let's be honest. We could spend, I could spend probably 10 or 15 sessions just on the second coming. Okay, I could spend 20 or 30 sessions on eternity and all aspects of the millennial kingdom and all of those things. But what we're going to do is hit the highlights uh, using not only chapters 20 through 22, so we won't be going through it verse by verse, but looking at, at you know, one of the, when you're looking at the millennial kingdom, one of the best places to look is actually Ezekiel. Ezekiel spends about, I don't know, uh, about a, an eighth of the whole book of Ezekiel is that from chapters 40 on, so it actually may be closer to a quarter, he spends all that time talking about the Millennial Kingdom. So uh, we're going to do that next week. Then March 7th, we're going to look at what's next. We're what we're going to do is tie all of this together. All of these things that we've learned, we're going to tie together. Uh, but first we're going to look at the God Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39. What does that look like? And we're going to look at Psalm 83, the War of Psalm 83. Um, this shows the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, because up until just recently, Psalm 83 was not, not seen as a prophetic psalm. It was seen as something that historically had happened. But when you really look at it, it never historically happened. Uh, because what it is is all the countries around Israel coming to fight Israel. And they're wiped out. But it's not the God Magog war because it's different countries. And so, real quickly, what you see is when you look at the God Magog countries of Ezekiel 38 and 39, you see a hole of countries around Israel. There's, there's a donut around Israel where there's nobody fighting them Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. None of these guys are fighting them. But yet, all of these guys are fighting them in Psalm 83. So what it leads you to believe is Psalm 83 happens first. They wipe them out. Then they have no need for villages, or for walls around their villages. And then that's when God and Magog happens. So we'll look at that. And then finally, on the, the 14th of March, this will be the last session of the Revelation study. What, we're, what I'm going to do is put together scenarios. All of, Remember what we've said. All of these things are finish line events. That, you know, God and Magog is a finish line event. Uh, the second coming is a finish line event. It's at the end. It's the finish line. Well, the thing is, is you've got a race to run. You've got a path you've got to get to the finish line. And so what we're going to do is look at possible scenarios by which the finish line is reached. How do we get God and Magog to invade Israel? How, how do we get a one world currency? How do we get all these things that or finish line events. How, what's the scenario that brings it all together? And so we'll look at that. Um, what I, you know, think about what's going on in Syria right now. Now you've got Turkey and Saudi Arabia about to fight, possibly, against Russia, Iran, and Syria. What does that mean? you really think about it, if you break it down into its basic principles, what that means is there could be a Sunni-Shia war about to happen in Syria. One of the finish line events is that in Gog, 80, uh, Gog in Psalm 83, what you see is cooperation between what we know now as Sunni countries and Shia countries. Something has to happen to cause these two groups to be one. Either they have to come to an agreement or one of them has to be wiped out. Okay? What you see now happening in Syria today, if you get on the news, get on the BBC, what you see right now, because you won't see it on American news. Why? Because we're wall-to-wall -wall election coverage. But what you see happening right now is a setup 
to an all-out Sunni Shia war. And that has major prophetic implications like you cannot even believe, and that's what we're going to talk about in the scenarios. How does it all tie up? Okay. But for today, today we are looking at, yes sir? Did you talk about the big breakfast? No. I figure, I know. The big breakfast is a potluck breakfast. Everybody, you're bringing that again. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I take orders. Wow. <laughs> okay. Excellent. I have a Really? Really? Uh, Think of all them. in here like Baba Cool. Everybody knows what we're No, nobody knows what we're Not everybody knows what we're He loves what? Baba Cool. Oh, cool. oh yeah. What yeah. is that? We'll we'll just no, we'll, we'll talk about it as we get closer. <laughs> uh, you know, because I don't want everybody to bring so much that we all go home with so much. We need to. Everybody needs to bring a little. You know, and we'll yeah. we'll just we'll get one of the, a couple of the tables and we'll spread it out kind of like what we did back Rosh Hashanah. on Rosh Hashanah. Okay. All right. So today, session twenty-eight. We're looking at Revan. Do you believe we've been in this 28 sessions? No. That's 28 long weeks I've been seeing you. I know. I know. It's terrible, ain't it? <laughs> so, Revelation 19. This is what we've been building it for 28 weeks. The second coming. This is what it's all about. It's the second coming. So, as we look at Revelation 19, the first thing we see is the marriage supper of the Lamb. The first part of Revelation 19 is the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, the first 10 verses of Revelation 19, we have the bride. <coughs> so, obviously, this is before the second coming. So, this is something that happens. Remember, in the Jewish wedding, you have seven days of, of feasting and consummation of the marriage and all these things. And then on the last day is the marriage supper. And you have guests to the marriage supper. You have guests, but you also have the, the, the bride is there, okay? So we see the bride here in heaven. It's represented a great multitude. And they're singing hallelujah. Now, we like to say hallelujah a lot, especially when we get excited. But what's interesting is that this is the only place in the New Testament you see hallelujah. Huh. It's, it's an Old Testament mm -hmm. phrase. It's, I believe, 24 times it's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the Psalms and, and other passages, but only here. Now, why I think that's important is that the Holy Spirit wrote the Scripture. And the Holy Spirit saved this very special work to describe the marriage supper. So, <clears throat> what the Holy Spirit did... And I think it would be an interesting word study to go back and look in the Old Testament and, and, and see every time it was used and in what context it's used. But I believe if we were to do that, what we would find is it's all, of, all the time about praise about God, praise to God. So what, <clears throat> what more praise could there be than the consummation of all things? Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the soon, the impending coming of Christ and the setup of the kingdom of David. He sits on David's throne. That is a hallelujah worthy mm -hmm. moment. And so in a sense, what the Holy Spirit does here is, and I hate to say it like this, but he doesn't cheapen the word by overuse. What is a word that we overuse that's cheapened now? Awesome. Wow. Awesome? Love. Uh, uh, listen, you say that. <laughs> Go there. Awesome. What does awesome mean? To me, awesome means like something only God can be. Exactly right. Yeah. It's to be in awe. Yeah. Okay? Okay? What I was going at, though, was love. That's, a, that's an excellent one, too, because you're right. Awesome. But love. Okay? I told my little puppy dog I love her this morning. I love you, little puppy dog. <laughs> so... Uh, I love that song. I love, I love that song. Yeah, I love that show. That show, yeah. I love these shoes. Okay? We have really cheapened the word love through overuse. 
And I find it amazing that the Holy Spirit did not do that. But at the same time, I don't find it amazing because he's the Holy Spirit and he's God. Okay? So he saves hallelujah, the phrase hallelujah, for the best. All right? So what are they hallelujahing about? Well, they're hallelujahing about the destruction of false religion. Because seven, verse seven, uh, these first verses of 19 actually really go well with the last part of 18. And if we remember back last week, the destruction of false Babylon, the Babylonian system of false religion, is what's destroyed. And that, even though we got a different chapter, it, the thought carries over. Now, this is so key, and I know I've said this before, but I want to make sure everybody understands. Chapters are put there by man. Yeah. Okay? Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Chapters and verses. So when you yeah, quote the scripture, I've said this before, when you're quoting scripture and you're saying chapter and verse, that's fine. But don't get all bent around the axle if you're not. Because I just read again this morning in Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus said, Has not the prophet said from the mouth of babes? Okay? Well, what prophet, Jesus? Well, it's understood that you know. See, it's understood that you know your scripture. And if you don't know what prophet he's talking about, you didn't know he was talking about Zechariah had said that, and not Isaiah or Jeremiah, but Zechariah had said that. And if you don't know... Mm, why don't you learn? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, and you know, we when you're studying the scripture, it is very habitual for us to go chapter by chapter. But on some of the smaller epistles, I urge you, when you sit down and read the scripture, even if it's Hebrews and it's 13 chapters, or even if it's 1 Corinthians and it's 16 and Romans when it's 16, if you're going to tackle those, sit down when you can read it all together instead of piecemeal it. I know it's real, I realize it's hard to sit down and read all of Romans and get it, especially if you're like me and you're taking notes and you're writing things. And you know, it'll take it'll take me three hours to go through Romans, and that's just reading it, not studying it. But when you're reading Ephesians or Galatians or Philippians or Timothy's or Thessalon Thessalonians, read it, read it all. Because see, as I always said. You know, when I got love letters when I was at Camp Landing, Florida, and my, my beloved would send me a letter, I didn't read it a page at a time. Yeah. I didn't go, oh, first page is today. And then put it aside. Mm -mm. She sent me one that was like a book. It was like, what, 20-something pages or 30 pages or something? You know I read that all once at one time. Okay? And savored it. You savored it. That, that's the way we should be about God's work. So they're celebrating the destruction of false religion. Uh, it's a praise scene in heaven. And, and one of the questions we should ask ourselves is how will we fare? You know, how will we fare at this marriage supper? Are, are, you know, are we going to have a lot to sing praises about other than the obvious? But when we reflect upon our garments, the garments that we made for the marriage supper by our works and our deeds. Now, we're already clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, there's some rewards to be had. And I honestly don't believe that, because um, that would be pride, that I'm going to real. I think I will realize what I could have done, but I'm not going to be envious of what somebody else did. Okay. Um, and remember what I said. Jesus says he's going to wipe away every tear. It didn't say he wiped away every tear. That's a, that was at one point in the future that the tears get wiped away. I believe the, the Bema seat is going to be just grueling. And honestly, what I believe the Bema seat will be, besides the weighing of your works and your deeds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I believe the Bema seat of Christ will be this. God is going to show you what you could have been. 
if you would have just been obedient. Every time, if, if when you came to a fork in behavior, okay, whether or not to love that person or hate them, doesn't cost you your salvation, but every wrong turn you took, if you would have taken the right turn, this is what you could have done for the kingdom. And for someone who, like me, I'm an evangelist. When I think of all the wrong turns I've, ta I've taken, on the, I could have been so much further down the right road. Because every time you take a wrong turn, what happens, guys? You've got to first ask for directions. <clears throat> you know, And then you've got to take a bunch of right turns to get out. When you miss that exit. When you miss that exit in downtown Dallas because of the construction and you can't get over in the traffic. We did that going like to Tyler. To, I like to call it taking a field trip. Well, we did take a field trip. We, we took a field trip <clears> through <throat> downtown Dallas because when we got on the exit, they'd done construction and we couldn't get over because it was rush hour. That's our Christian life. What if we'd have just stayed on the highway? Okay, God is going to show us this is what you could have been. I believe that is going to cause some severe weeping. I know I'm going to cry. I'm going to go, wow, I blew it. But thanks for the grace of God. Okay? All right. So, verses 7 through 9, we have the marriage supper. We see that his bride has made herself ready. She's clothed in fine linen, bright and pure. Bless you. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, as I said, this is not our righteousness. This is the righteousness of Christ. So, uh, then we see... Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so I just ask you to go back and think about Matthew 25 and about the whole Jewish wedding analogy. Here we have John using it again because it's, it's, it's being seen in heaven. And it's one of these things, guys, if you, if you fail to just sit there and think in context about Scripture, you're going to miss some of the finer details. Because I guarantee you, many of Christians have thought about, oh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But they didn't relate it to the fact that, you know, the Jewish wedding. And it comes after seven days of celebration. And, and you know, and, and the biggest part is you're with the bridegroom. Okay. So, that is the first part of Revelation 19. And now let's get into the meat. The second coming. All right? So, remember we have the white horse in the, uh, Revelation 6-2. That's the first seal. Here's, some, here's what we see uh, Jesus is called, the writer here. He's faithful and true. We see that his eyes are like a flame of fire. He has many crowns. They're diadems. They're not stephanus like the writer in Revelation 6 has. He has one stephanus. Jesus here has many, many diadems, many king crowns. Not just a conqueror, he's a king. Okay? And he's not just a king, he's the king of all kings, mm -hmm. which is why he has many diadems. He has a name on him that nobody knows. That's interesting. Now, we're going to be given a name that nobody knows. We're going to have a white rock, remember? And, and, and so names are important. Uh, now, this is amazing here. He wears a robe that's dipped in blood. He is the Word of God. Now, go back and read when you get a chance, John 1, the first 14 verses, and you will see John is very, this is a theme of John's. This is a theme of John's as Chuck's been talking about in 1 John. Okay? It's a theme of John in the epistle, uh, or the, the gospel of John, and it's a theme in the book of Revelation. That Jesus is the Word of God. He is the Word. What does John say in John 1? He is the Word, what? Made flesh. Made flesh. And we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Son of God. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Amazing. He has a robe. And on his thigh is written a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, in case there was any doubt who he is, he's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. The armies which follow him. Here we go, guys. Here we are. This is us. Think about that for a second. This is you. I, I mean, Herman, I hope I'm right, ne right next to you, brother. 
I mean, I can ride a horse okay. I don't know how good you are, but if you start to stumble and fall off, I'll pick you up. Pretty good. You're pretty good? You're All right. right. Well, we might have to help Javi. Oh, yeah, that's better. Help we'll put Javi between us. That's, that's, that. that's, that's better. But she used to break horses. So wow. She, I want her on the other side. That's That sounds like an even better plan. So I'll, I'll be between Herman and, and Carrie. You can be on the other side. I mean, we, we, just, we laugh about but just think about that, guys. One day, when we are coming out of heaven, we are going to be full with the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be headed down. We're going to all be on horses. You can hear him with his spurs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if God's going to ride, have us ride horses, he's going to make us the best there ever was. I think you're very true. Regardless whether And you're one day we're going to be with all these saints and our loved ones. I think God's not going to group us 20 miles apart. I think we're going to be in little groups of our, our, our people. And we're going to be looking at each other. Can you imagine the smiles on our faces? I mean, look at the smile now. I, it just blows my mind to think about this. Huh? It's being on comprehension. I can't, <laughs> can't even think of it. The excitement. So we're wearing fine linen, pure and white. How did we get that? Through Christ. Mm -hmm. We're following Him and we're on white horses. And But as joyful as this is, it's also very sad. Because we're going to the harvest. Remember what we had seen previously. The last three angels of the bowls of wrath were to, to wind the wine press of the wrath of God. Let's be so thankful that we are not subject to the wrath of God. You know, that's what John 3.36 says. For he who believes, you know, he's with God. But he who does not believe, the wrath of God, what? Remains on him. See, that's very important remains. In other words, the wrath of God is already on us until we come to Christ. We have it taken off when we place our faith in Christ. And for those who have not placed faith in Christ, it still remains. And guess what? It remains righteously. It remains because it's deserved. Not because God's evil. He's some unloving God. You don't deserve His, His mercy. God would have been fully justified and fully right to not allow one of us into heaven and just him and the son and some of the angels up there. That would have been, you know, but God in his infinite mercy. So he's going to strike down the nations with the word of God. And then we see in 17 and 18 that all the birds of the air, all your carnivorous birds are called. Now I think this is something that happens ahead of time. <clears throat> towards the end of time, towards the end of, towards this, all of a sudden you're going to notice that all your buzzards are gone. You know, if you're living in southeast Texas and, and all hell is breaking loose on the earth and there's probably good feed for buzzards because of all the dead bodies, one day you're going to notice that they're all gone if you're here and living in sin and, and, and rejecting the Lord. And the reason why is they're all hightailing it to the Battle of Armageddon because it's going to take every one of them. All right. The army of the Antichrist along with the armies of the other world powers are drawn to battle to make war against Christ and His return. The Antichrist is captured in verse 20 along with the false prophet and they are thrown alive in the lake of fire. Everybody else is killed by Christ. Remember, somehow in this battle, the Antichrist and Isa, is it Isa? The false prophet, the imposter, they're going to be captured alive and thrown alive. They're, they're, it's not going to be their soul going in. It's going to be their bodies. I've often wondered, uh, Brother Nelson, you know, the Bible says thrown into the lake of fire. I, I wondered if they're going to be literally, literally thrown or left. But the Bible says thrown. I think they're going to be picked up, manhandled, and tossed. Yeah, I believe. So, so here's the setup. Let's get into the scenario. Let's get into scenarios here. Uh, Joel says he's going to gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. He's going to enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 8 says, Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to cease to pray, for my decision is to gather all nations to assemble kingdoms to pour out upon them my indignation and my burning anger. 
And then in Zechariah, I'm not going to read all of this, I'm going to paraphrase it. In Zechariah 14, all nations are gathered against Jerusalem to battle. The city will be taken, houses plundered. The Lord will go out and fight against those nations. So this is all, as you can see, it all matches Revelation 19. This is what's happening. The Old Testament prophets get in a little bit more detail. All right. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. What did, what did the angel say in Acts 1? Why are you guys all in amazement? The very same Christ. Oh, Lord, like man, he He's going to return in like man. Mm -hmm. Okay? On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. It lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west in a very wide valley. Now, part of the mountain's going to move forward. Part of the mountain's going to move southward. Guess what they discovered underneath Jerusalem? There's a fault. There's a fault line. Mm -hmm. An east-west fault. Amazing. It is amazing. And this was written in a time where they didn't even know there was such a thing as fault lines. That thing, opens. That thing <laughs> opens up. And it changes the landscape. We see that in Ezekiel 47, where the river comes out. And, and it gets deeper as it goes down. It comes out of the throne. So, yes, sir. I hate to keep throwing this up. Oh. Seeing it's Michael who fights for Israel, for Israel mm -hmm. on God's behalf, will he be the one doing the chunking? Or him? It could be. <laughs> he's a, I heard he's a, the champion dwarf tosser, so uh, he could be it. He could be it. Okay. So let's, let's look at some maps. All right, let's look at some maps. Remember that the blood is going to run for 200 miles or 1,600 stadia. We see that in Revelation 14.20. So here is the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Here's Megiddo. And here is Edom. What is in Edom? This is Basra. This is Petra. This is probably where the Jews flee to. In Revelation 12. And Matthew 24. So they go down here. So let's look at this. There's Megiddo. <clears throat> see this Je the valley of Jezreel we see that's another word we got the valley of Jehoshaphat they call it the valley of Ar Armageddon Armageddon the valley of Jezreel they're all the same thing they just have some different names kind of like with Houston we got H town you know we got all the you know NYC is the big apple you know we got different names yeah so here's the valley now let me show you a different view this is looking north looking south so this is kind of looking east this is a relief map and here's the valley of jezreel this is where the battle is going to happen right here right all in here now tell me the how big that is in comparison to you know this would be about 10 miles right here okay, okay? and as we talked about a couple weeks ago or maybe last week there's nazareth this is where jesus grew up looking over the jezreel valley that's right how many times did he go out and play and look over the place where he was going to come again and judge all nations? It's just one of those things that my mind naturally likes to fill in blanks. You know? Yeah, it, it's, to me it's amazing. So, let's look at the scenario. We've got to get, get moving here. Look at the scenario. We see the scenario in Daniel 11. Alright? Uh, the king of the south is attacking him. The king of the north uh, rushes upon him and is talking about rushing it. The king of the south attacks the Antichrist. The king of the north comes against the Antichrist. Uh, and he shall come into all countries and shall overflow and pass through. And we need to remember this is not Ezekiel 38 39. This is another war. Uh, in verse 41, he shall come into the glorious land. Tens of thousands shall fall. This is, this is Israel, the glorious land. Uh, Edom and Moab, this is interesting, the main part of the Ammonites shall be delivered out of his hands. In other words, he doesn't attack them. Well, that's modern day Jordan. And if we go back and look at where the Antichrist has to come from because of Revelation 17, 10 and 11, we see that Jordan is a big part of that. We know it's not Egypt because we see the king of the south attacking him and the king of the south is Egypt. So we can actually take that part off. So he has to come from somewhere in here. 
And it is a common belief amongst Islamics that the Mahdi comes from Jordan. So it's very possible that the Assyrian could be the leader of Jordan. And maybe that is the reason why Jordan escapes out of his hands. He doesn't attack his own country. Is that what happens? I don't know. But that's a scenario. That's why it's called scenario, not the fact. Okay? Uh, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So see, he is going against Egypt. It would be very unlikely that the Antichrist would actually attack his own country reward. Okay? For one thing, they would all be following him. So he becomes the ruler of treasures and gold. The Libyans, the Kushites, so that's the Sudan, Ethiopia, and Somalia. Uh, news from the east and the north will alarm him. And he goes out in great fury. So the bad news is that the kings of the east are assembling. He hears that the kings of the east are coming, the 200 million man army. So 200 million men have come to the east to do battle. We see that in the sixth trumpet and the sixth bowl. We've got the drying up of the river Euphrates to make room for them to come over, and they are now headed over. That is the news that the Antichrist hears that gets him worried. Wow, how do I defeat an army of 200 million people? Okay? Uh, countries and regions, or maybe the 10 kings of Revelation 17, they become tired of the rule of the Antichrist. There's a period where it's all lovey-dovey. Everybody loves him. Hey, we got, hey we're, we're in with you. Then there becomes a time when they're not. So they're gathered. This is what the Battle of Armageddon is. We need to remember, and I think I put this in the next slide. We need to remember that the Battle of Armageddon is not a battle. It's a war. And it's not just a one-time deal. It's a, it's a campaign that occurs for a length of time. And what really happens is, is that all of these countries now come out to fight each other. They don't just come, God gathers them to fight against Jesus. Right. They don't know it at the time that that's what they're about to do. Just like in Ezekiel, uh, uh, yeah. or he says they'll put hooks in the jaw. That's right. You to come You're going to draw them. In other words, they're, they're, they're going to be hooked. They're, they're coming one way or the other. And they you leave look. I slipped for last time I saw the earth. Yep. So... At this time, the Antichrist and his army and all these other armies that have gathered together to fight against the Antichrist and each other, Jesus comes, they turn their attention to Christ. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, is what happens here. So that unites them. That unites them. Now they've got a bigger enemy. So the king of China or whoever in India have sent 200 million men to battle against the Antichrist. Because remember, the news from the east and the north alarms him. He's, he's hearing these re intel reports. And then when Jesus comes, they, the kings of the east realize, you know what? Uh, we got a bigger problem. Uh, who is this army of hundreds and hundreds of millions riding out of heaven on horses? Okay. So here's a scenario. you got the king of the east. They're coming in here. And from the north, they're coming in here. The Antichrist is, is already here. The king of the south, they fight. And then we got Ammon, Moab, and Edom. And they're all right in here. And so God brings all of them here. So remember, the Jews have fled to Petra. And Jesus goes here to Petra after the Battle of Armageddon to deliver the Jews. This is what is known as the Basra Deliverance. In theology, we call it the Basra Deliverance. And we get it out of Micah 2. Surely I assemble all of you, O Jacob, and gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold. They're in a fold. They're protected. Uh, he who opens up the breach goes before them. They break through and pass the gate. And going by it, their king passes on before him, the Lord at their head. Okay? So that's where this is. Basra is right there next to Petra. It's the same area in ancient Edom. And then here is where we see the words, the Basra deliverance uh, out of Isaiah 63. Who is it comes from Edom? In crimson garments from Basra. He who is splendid in his apparel. Now who is this? This is Jesus. Marching in the greatness of his strength. It is, and, and, and you know, his crimson garments. What is that? <coughs> what did we just read? 
The robes dripped in blood in Revelation 19. It's the same thing. It's the same man. It's Jesus Christ. Uh, yes, sir. One more question. All right, no. He enters Jerusalem through the eastern gate. Yep. And it's, you know, been sealed up and everybody's built a, a, a cemetery. cemetery yep. right there. But, uh, hang on, stop. No, because, it, because we get a cleavage. Right. So, okay, so here's a scenario subject to scrutiny. Christ comes to fight all nations and destroys them. Then he heads to Basra. So, you can. <laughs> What? No. No, okay. <laughs> so here's a scenario. For him to not catch that. Okay. I, I'm trying to get done here. Uh, here's the scenario. The first thing that happens on this day is Christ comes to fight all the nations at the at Armageddon. He doesn't go to Jerusalem first. He goes to Armageddon first. Okay. Then he goes to Basra to free the Jews. He get, gets all the Jews, the Messianic Jews, out of Basra. Then he goes to Jerusalem. Because remember, what we've got here in these scriptures is we've got a, a picture of this happening, a picture of this happening, and a picture of this happening. But it's not necessarily ever put in chronological order. You know, does he go to Jerusalem first and then, he, then go to Armageddon? Because that's actually, you know, 100 and something miles away. And Basra is a couple hundred miles away. So... It's got, you know, he can't be in, he could be, but he's not going to be in all three places at once. So there has to be a, I'm here first, then I'm here, then I'm here. To me, the likely scenario is he battles the armies, slays them, they throw the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire, uh, into the lake of fire, or the bottomless pit. Then he goes and delivers the Jews out of Basra. Then he goes to Jerusalem. Because see, where does he end up in? He ends up in Jerusalem. So it would make more sense that that's his last stop since that's where we see him in Ezekiel 44. Uh, yeah, well, 41 through 47. That's where we see him. So he does this, he does this. The very last stop in the, in the trip is Jerusalem. So he or his designates then go throughout the all the earth uh, and they, they gather the judgment of the sheep and the goats together. That's Matthew 7, 22. <clears throat> Remember... Just because he's done all this stuff, there, there's a lot of people sitting off in Rochere in Texas still, if they're still alive, who have rejected Christ. Uh, they're not out on the battlefield. Uh, they're not part of that army. Somehow they've got to be dealt with. All right? So either Christ or his designation. And remember, this is what we talked about the Islamic prophecies. They have a prophecy that at the end of that seven years, this Dijal is going to come and some of his followers are going to come and try to convince them that he is the Christ. And so when we flip that on his head, what we see is that, that people will be all over the world and Jesus Christ or his designates will make an appearance and basically be the one dividing the sheep and the goat. This could be an explanation for what we see in Daniel 12, 11 and 12. Because we have 1,260 days... Jerusalem's trodden down by the Gentiles for 1260 days. Uh, it's 1290 days from the end of it until the des uh, from the desolation, the Antichrist declares himself God till the end is 1290 days. And it says, Blessed is he who wakes and arrives at the 1335 days. It could be that it takes 45 days to go throughout all the world. I mean, think about it. That's a lot. Could we do it instantly? Yeah, but it may be that there's a process here. A 45-day process by which we are sent out, depending on our rewards, to Rocher in Texas, or Houston, Texas, or New York City, or Bangkok, Thailand, where we then go out and say, yeah, you're alive, and you were following, the, you know, you're a follower of Jesus, you're a sheep, you are, have the mark of the beast on you, you're a goat. And at that point, we judge them. Okay? That's a scenario. To me, it's the, one of the things, because I've always tried to reconcile this. For, what is this 45 days for? Blessed is he who waits and arrives. So this is like the end point. And it's, it's from a beginning point, which is the desolation, the abomination of desolations. 
So that's the starting point. That's day one. Well, what is, and then we know at 1290 is when Jesus comes. But what is that 45-day period? To me, that's the cleansing of the earth. That's that point which we're going out where Jesus himself is going from town to town. I don't know how it'll work. Uh, and the judgment of the sheep and goats are happening at a very local level. Makes, I mean, that's a scenario. So, whew. Questions? Stunned silence. That's a lot to take in. It is a lot to take in. Like I said, I could have spent 10 sessions on the second coming. Because when you realize, now think about this, why did the Jews have such a hard time with the first coming? Because they, they, there's so much about the second coming. We really would probably spend way more than 10 weeks, probably more like 20, if we went through every scripture about the second coming of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Because it literally is about 10 to 15% of the Old Testament. How long would it take us at 40 minutes a pop to read through 10, 15% of the Old Testament? Yeah. It's, you can't do it. So, all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are just so thankful when we, we realize the blessings that you have for us. The things that await us, Lord, as, as children of the Most High, it, it's, as Brother Herman said, it's inconceivable. Father, it is it's beyond our belief and imagination to even consider what it's going to be like that day. Father, all I know is that we're grateful that through no righteousness of our own, but the righteousness of your Son, that we'll be a part of it. And we'll be a big part of it. And Father, it's amazing to read the things that we will do one day. But Father, today's about today. So as we go forward, I pray that we would worship you in spirit and truth, and that we would serve you with our minds squarely fixed on eternity and not on our present state. We love you, Father, and we praise you in Christ's name.